All right, good morning, Facebook family and friends. This is your favorite Sunday school teacher, third vice president, Asher board number four, K. Edward Copeland, chief custodian of New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. I'm at an undisclosed uh, location today, and I'm hoping by God's grace, I'm praying, pardon me, by God's grace that you'll be able to hear me and see me clearly and so as we uh, sort of get our technology uh, together, come on in the room and let me know if you can hear and see clearly. I'm hoping that this um, lighting will be sufficient for my chocolate coating and that you can um, see and hear clearly. Come on in here. Let's get ready for Sunday school children. I'm grateful to God for another beautiful day he's given us. Okay, thank you, little bit. I'm thankful uh, for another opportunity to watch God work. And I want to know what you're grateful for. Come on and check in as you get into your digital seating. Uh, tell me how you're doing this morning and what you're most grateful for, the top three things you're most grateful for. I'll start off. I'm so grateful. This is a, kind of a little busy stretch for me, but God has been giving me everything I need. Uh, sometimes, um, even at this stage in ministry, I'm, I feel a certain kind of way in terms of inadequacy or, man, did I prepare enough or am I overprepared? You know, will the Lord use me? And he's proven himself faithful time and time again. So I'm grateful to God uh, that he still has his hands on me. I really appreciate that. And I'm thankful here, even this weekend, got to reconnect with some, um, man, with just some of the best people in the world. Um, in particular, got to see a young man who I hadn't seen in a long time. And um, he's doing well. Got a beautiful family. Uh, just a good man, good husband, good father. And that just gave me great joy to see him doing well. And I'm grateful uh, to God just for his sustaining power. Uh, my family's doing well. Uh, everybody that I'm connected to seems to, even if they're struggling, they're being sustained by the grace of God. And so I'm grateful for all of that. Today, we're going to uh, get into the book of James, but I need you to go ahead and check in. And I want to thank uh, those of you. I'm in a different time zone today, and I came on an hour too early and I was getting ready to go forth with the two or three people that were online. And then I thought somebody mentioned the time zone and I'm like, oh man. So I jumped back on now and I wanted to uh, get here at the appropriate time. So our friends out on the West Coast, our uh, Sunday school members on the West Coast, they're already getting up extremely early and I didn't want them to miss out. So come on and check in. I'm ready to go. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible to James chapter 1. Today we're talking about tempted and tried. We're in this theme of wisdom. Our key word at New Zion this year, which by the way, I'm a, yeah, you told me that you can hear and see clearly, so I'm going I'm to go forward. Our key word this year is legacy. We're honoring uh, the legacy that's been passed on to us and forging a new legacy for the future generations. But one of the things that we want to transfer, one of the things that is underappreciated, particularly in our community, we very often talk about generational wealth, but we don't talk about generational wisdom, the, the skill in godly living that needs to be passed on from generation to generation. How many of you know if you can get hold to some wise, older counselors, you can avoid a lot of headaches, a lot of hangups, a lot of hiccups in your life, if you can get some generational wisdom transferred down to you. Now, our concern uh, today is we have spent, I don't know, several weeks in the book of Proverbs. Now we're going to turn to the New Testament book of James. Open up your Bible to James chapter 1, and let's see what godly wisdom we can get as it relates to handling trials 
and temptations. This is my concern today. Now, the book of James, let me give you just a little bit of context because we want to jump right in today. The book of James was written by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's half-brother, James, or uh, Jacob in the Hebrew. And he's writing to believers who, particularly Jewish believers who've been scattered abroad. You remember from the book of Acts that God's plan was for uh, the nascent, the infant church to start in Jerusalem, go to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world, spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll also know from the book of Acts that at first they sort of stayed clustered and cloistered there in Jerusalem, but God, through persecution, governmental persecution, he sort of scattered the church so they would spread out like he originally intended. James became one of the, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote this book, became one of the pillars in the Jerusalem church. And now he's writing to those Jewish Christians who have been scattered abroad, and he's transferring some wisdom. Now remember, he's the half-brother of Jesus. So he heard and got a lot of stuff from Jesus, and it's obvious from reading the book that he read, meditated on, learned from the book of Proverbs, which we have just left. So he takes all of that wisdom from what he heard firsthand from the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as from Proverbs, and now he's passing wisdom on down uh, to us. And he starts out, let's, let's jump in. Do you have your Bible open? James chapter one. Now, let me, before I even start this, let me say, you really need to pay attention to this text because many of us fall into despair, discouragement, sometimes even depression, simply because we don't know the nature of trials and temptations and how to handle them. But let me be very clear with you. Long as you own this planet, <laughs> on this side of eternity, long as you are here among uh, the saints and sinners uh, that you reside, you will be tempted and you will be tried. You will have temptations that if you're not careful, you can fall into certain patterns where you just give in to certain temptations. We'll, we'll look at the anatomy of sin here in just a second and you will face trials. You will face testings. That's part of the process. You can't get out of that. Open up your Bible. Let's, start, let's jump in it right here. James chapter one. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole chapter at once, but let's get at least the first few verses here. It says, James, a bond servant of God. By the way, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. You follow along in whatever translation you have. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Now, here it is. Verse two three, four. Let's just start with that. Consider it all joy. O King James says, count it all joy. My brethren, or my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I don't know if I'm going to get past this, but I'm going to try my best. James says up front, now, he gives us an admonition. He gives us an imperative, gives us something to do. He says, count it all joy, consider it all joy, reckon it all joy. And we're going to talk about this idea that joy is actually a calculation. But how can I do that, James? Count, count it all joy if you fall in. No, he doesn't say if. He says when you encounter various multicolored, multidimensioned trials knowing that the testing in your faith produces endurance. So let me help you out just up front before we even dive straight into the lesson. And that is this, it ain't a if, it's a when. <laughs> you, you, who, who, when you got saved, where did you get a waiver that said, okay, well, this one ain't got to go through nothing because I need one of them. No, no, when you, he that would live godly will suffer persecution. Trials, watch this, and it ain't even got nothing to do with your uh, 
with your Christianity in one sense, because there's certain trials that come upon everybody. Everybody went through the pandemic. That wasn't personal. We was all, <laughs> we were all being tested in, in a whole lot of different ways. Temptations are inevitable. But Paul says, listen, you got to learn some calculus. You got to learn to count it, to reckon it. It's a financial term. It's a banking term. Are you familiar or you need to be familiar with debits and credits? Uh, one goes on one side of the ledger, the other goes on the other side of the letter or ledger. Or if you are familiar with assets and liabilities, or we ain't even got to go that far. If you if you pull up your little app or you pull up your your little account, your bank account, either there's going to be a positive balance <laughs> or a negative balance, <laughs> right? Paul, uh, James says here, look here, when you are faced with trials of any kind, and notice he says uh, when you encounter various trials, the word there is a word that means multicolored, um, multidimensional, of various shapes and sizes. In other words, not only do we all face trials, but we face different types of trials over time. And very often trials and very often even temptations come in clusters. They come in packets. They come in groups. And James says, when you encounter, not if, but when you encounter all these different types of, let me say something just in passing right here. I hope you understand that as you grow in Christ, and even as you process and progress in age, the types of trials and temp temptations that you face change up on you. They're, they're multicolored, they're multifaceted, they're multidimensional. He says, that's all right, even though they're multifaceted, multicolored, and all that kind of stuff, you're going to face different types of trials, depending on where you are in your phase of life and where you are in your stage of maturity in Christianity, he says, I need you to put that, listen, I need you to consider this an asset. I, I need you to put this in the positive side of your ledger. How can I do that, Paul? Now, here's a, here's a key to this first chapter. He's, he's going to give us sort of a, a, a way to deal with the calculus of maturity uh, because that's his ultimate goal, our spiritual maturity. That's why he's writing this book. And he's saying that the way you do the calculus, the way you get to joy, is you got to know something. Children, listen, this, this is why we study the Bible. This is why we stay within the fellowship of the saints so we can encourage one another in the scripture. Because many of us are are sour Christians because we've never been taught the calculus of joy. See, joy is not based on what's happening now. Joy is based on, I understand the calculus of what now is doing for my future. Okay, let me see, let me see if I can say it a, a different way. You can only you you can only have joy now if you understand that what's happening now is ensuring something for your future. And when you get a clear vision of the end result, a clear understanding, a clear knowledge of what this process I'm going through is accomplishing, then you can have joy now. Yeah, I was at the. Uh, uh, my little fitness class the other day with my trainer, and I'm just sweating, and me and another person, as we were going through the paces of what our little trainer was uh, telling us to do, we looked at each other, and we just sweating, we tired, and all that kind of stuff. We're out of wind, and we looked at each other and got to laugh and said, you know what? And said, and we're paying for this. We're paying somebody to make us sweat and to make us do stuff that we don't want to do, and bend ways and lift stuff that we don't want to let. We actually pay somebody to do this and we in here huffing and puffing and tired and sweating and all that kind of stuff. We started laughing at one another because we understood, yes, right now I'm tired. Right now I'm sweating. Right now 
I'm lifting stuff and, you know, doing this, that, and other. Uh -huh, but wait till summer comes. See? <laughs> when you say sun's out, guns out, wait till. See, I, I, I'm going through this now because I understand this is the process that's going to get me where I want to be in the future. Let me hit it from a different angle. When I was, uh, this is years ago, probably, I think, maybe about 20, 24, 25 years ago, I used to have severe sinus problems. I'm, I'm talking about like twice a year, at least, uh, as the seasons would change, like, you know, spring to summer or summer to fall. Man, my allergies would just kick in to such an extent that usually I'd be laid out for like at least a, a, a week, you know, just behind all of this. And so I, finally I went to a good doctor. Her name was, uh, not that I had bad doctors, but I went to a doctor that specialized in some things. Her name was Dr. Cynthia Go. I'll never forget her. And she said, you know, you can take all these, you can keep, keep taking shots and keep, you know, putting this stuff in your notes. She said, but the problem is, Ain't nobody dealt with the real problem here. She said, are you familiar with turbinates? I said, no, I never heard that. She said, there's little folds of skin in your nostrils. And she said, your turbinates are swollen. So the medicine can't get to what it's supposed to do. And you're going to keep on having problems. She said, but I specialize in a surgery. Listen to what I'm saying. She said, I'm, I specialize in a surgery. surgery. I'm going to trim your turbinates. Plus, you have a deviated septum. In other words, Inside my nose was crooked and this, that, and that. She said, I'm going to get you right structurally. She said, but I'm going to tell you the truth now. She said, the recovery process, that is, after the surgery, they have to, you know, pack stuff, and, you know. She said, you're going to have to breathe through your mouth for a good, uh, a good two weeks. She said, and she said, and you're going to be miserable during those two weeks. She said, but if you trust me, I'll never forget. She said, if you trust me, believe what I'm saying. She said, I promise you, after you come through the process, your worst days will be better than your best days has been. I said, I said, lady, I don't, I don't know you, but I've looked at your resume and I believe, I believe you. I said, go on and do the little surgery. Sure enough, she did the surgery, came out. Man, as soon as I came out that uh, the uh the little recovery, I was miserable because I had to breathe through my mouth. Now, mind you because my sinuses were usually stopped up. I was breathing through my mouth anyway, but I didn't even have an option to breathe through my nose. And man, I was just, I was just moaning and this, that, and other. But I remember what she said. She said, if you can stick with the process, she said, I promise you, you're going to be all right. Bless be God. Two weeks later, she came, took all the packing out and did this, that, and other. And just like she said, just like she said, it's been 25 years. Just like she said, my, my, I've never had as, uh, on this side of the surgery, my worst days have been better than some of my best days were before I went through the process. Now, I went through that whole long thing to tell you, if I could trust Dr. Go, I hadn't even met her before. I don't know what her background, I just read her little resume. And I went in and she understood and she explained to me what was going on. I said, well, I trust you. If I can trust a doctor who's just a human like me, what, what make you think you can't trust God that he's doing something in the process? What's the process? Well, look in your Bible. He said, when you encounter various tri trials, what do you need to know? This is, the, this is the doctor telling you, okay, here's what's happening. Here's what the end result going to be. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces uh, I think old King James might say perseverance. King, the uh, new versions say endurance. Literally, it's the word that uh, means steadfastness. It means the ability to stand flat-footed and to stay up under pressure. Now listen, children. In your physical frame, the way you build muscle is time under tension. That's what you're doing when you're doing reps or when you're you know, doing this and doing that. If you put your muscles under tension for a certain amount of time, the muscle fibers break down and then God has fixed it so that whenever something is breaking down, when it builds back up, it'll build back stronger so it never has to go through that again. That's in your physical. But guess what? In the spiritual and emotional, 
listen to what I'm saying, the spiritual and emotional. God is building resilience in our emotional. He's building maturity in our spiritual man. The Bible says the way you can handle trials is you got to, first of all, reckon, consider it. Think about the fact that this is an opportunity for me to grow. Wait a minute, not just to grow. Read your Bible. Look at verse 2, 3, two, three and 4. It says that the testing of your faith is working patience. It's giving you endurance. But endurance is not the end goal. Listen carefully. Endurance is producing something in us. Look at verse 4. Let endurance have its desired effect, its end goal, its desired result. Endurance is producing something in us. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, uh, complete, lacking in nothing. That word, um, in essence, that word there, uh, perfect, means mature. In, in other words, God is after us being completely whole. He's trying to help us to grow up. And the only way, listen, the only way that only way that endurance, that patience, that steadfastness, uh, I'm, it's the, I'm using synonyms, the only way that can be produced is through trials, that is, time under tension, right? But the goal is not the endurance, the goal is the maturity, it's the completeness, it's the wholeness. You ever seen somebody, you ever got, you got any cousins that been, have spent some time in jail or in prison, they come out with what they call a prison bill. You ever seen that? Where a dude is just real buff up here. You look at his legs. See, well, boy, he got bird legs. Well, he's not complete. He's not whole. He ain't been exercising them legs. He's been on that uh, bench press and all that kind of stuff. Listen, God wants us to be complete and he wants us to be whole. And you can find joy even while you're going through various types of trials if you can remember, oh, wait a minute, this is part of the process. And if I learn how to stay up in this, if I hang on in here uh, with the appropriate boundaries in this relationship, if I hang on in here with this, you know, with my schooling, if I hang on in here with this thing that's going on in work, and if I use godly wisdom uh, in this situation, God is producing something in me. And maybe, let me just cut across the field. God is fully committed to your completion. Listen to what I'm saying. God don't want no half-baked Christians. And you got to stay in and up under some things uh, so that you can be fully formed, so that you can be, what does the Bible say? Look at verse four again. Let endurance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing fully formed as a Christian. Wait a minute, fully formed even emotionally as a Christian. That's why I put emotion in there too. Sometimes God allows us to go through things so that we can grow up emotionally, that we can develop resilience so that we can be fully mature as Christians. But here's the key. You can have joy in the process if you understand the end result. This is, what, let me give you another lick on that and then let's move forward. I'm, I'm trying to help you to see children because this, this is where Christian maturity, this is where wisdom comes when you recognize, okay, what's the end result? What's the outcome? And if I understand what the outcome is, then I can still have joy even though I'm going through some stuff right now. Yeah. One day I'm gonna graduate. So yeah, these midterms or the, yeah, these tests or the fact that I don't have any money yeah, I'm going to be poor for a minute while I'm in school, but that's because there's an outcome. There's a result that's going to, uh, that's going to uh, naturally flow as if I can stay in here, if I can stay up under the pressure. Yes, the marriage is sort of uh, having some struggles right now, but I've learned something about boundaries and all those types of things, and I'm going to stay up under this. I'm not going to enable somebody, but I'm going to see what God is doing in me through this process because ultimately he is committed to my completion. God is committed to your wholeness. 
He's committed to you being a fully formed Christian, not a half-baked Christian. And too many of us jump out the skillet. <laughs> he, he, he tried to, he trying to uh, make a pancake out of you, and you didn't jumped out the skillet jumped out the skillet before he can flip you. Talking about it's too high. No, you got to stay in there. You got to hang in there, uh, my friend. Let me give you uh, uh, another example of this, and then let's move forward with this. Uh, my associate of mine, I call him a friend. His name is Rudy Valdez. He uh, worked at what we now call, what do we call it? Collins Aerospace uh, uh, there in Rockford, Illinois. It used to be called Sunstrand. With, and so he w was a I can't remember if his title was project manager or super, project manager or supervisor. Somehow or another, he was a grand poobah in you know the structure there, and they were having trouble with this one department where you know the the, the workers were grumbling because there were certain specifications that they had to do things. Because now they build they build the guts for like the seven eighty seven and. It's an aerospace company. And so something was going on where they had to change some specs and sometimes the specs were off, but they needed it down to, it was less than a millimeter. They needed things to be like super precise. And so the people down in a certain department was grumbling and, you know, why we got to do this? Why we got to do this over and this, that, and another? And so Rudy wisely, he went down there and he listened to him, said, listened to him complaining, this, that, and another. He said, okay. He said, tell you what, y'all come with me. And so what he did was he took them throughout the rest of the plant, the rest of the uh, organization. And he told them, he said, now, you do realize, don't you, that you all are building parts for the space shuttle. And if if you don't do what you're supposed to do right, not only will the space shuttle not fly right, but, you know, people's lives can be in danger, this, that, and other. But you are giving people the ability to go into space. And once they saw the whole operation and saw all that was going on, then all of a sudden they stopped complaining because they recognized, okay, yeah, this is tough what we're doing, but the end result is space flight. See? Now, all I'm saying to you is, yeah, you're going through some stuff. Yeah, you're irritated at work with what they're doing. Yeah, you don't like, you know, this sort of phase in your life where maybe your body is not responding like it used to. And yeah, okay. Uh, things might not be going well in your finances, but you need, listen, you need to count it all joy when you have these opportunities to learn how to stay up under pressure over time because it's doing something in you, namely making you a fully formed Christian. You say, well, uh, the, the text verse four says uh, that God wants us to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. What is one of the things that we lack? Wisdom. <laughs> Is that the next verse? Verse five. But if any lack wisdom, I'm just reading my Bible. If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If in the midst of your thing, the situation, whatever it is that you're going through, you don't know what to do. The Bible says, here's what you need to do. Ask God to show you the next right thing to do. God, I need wisdom right here. I understand now and I'm counting it joy. I, I recognize you're doing something in me that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in me, that you're working in me an eternal weight of glory. That's Romans chapter, uh, that's Romans chapter 8 and that's 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 4, the last few verses. Okay, I get that, but I still got to live here. I don't know what to do. They getting on my last nerves at work. This marriage is challenging or the singleness is challenging or uh, raising my children or seeing about my sick parent or you know dealing with this thing this is challenging okay good help me jesus verse five if any lack wisdom let him ask of god who gives to all generously without reproach and it will be given him talk to god about that thing pause even now whatever it is i want you to stop right here right now what is it that you're going through? What is it that's causing you aggravation, irritation? What is it that you would really wish were different in your life? I want you to stop right now, get a piece of paper, write it down, and I want you to pause even now to ask God to show you the next right thing. Now, he's already showing you through scripture 
that the issue, the thing, the relationship, the trial, that ain't the issue. The issue is, what is he doing in me? What is he doing in you? I want you to ask God, give me wisdom to see what you're doing, to know what you want me to do in this situation. Do I need to reorient my boundaries because you're trying to teach me how to stop being an enabler? Do I need to have more empathy so you keep sending people who are aggravating so I can get off my little high horse and learn that other people are going through stuff too and I need to have a, 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 a I need to see people like you see them and have a more tender heart? Is it uh, I'm going through some financial things because I don't have any discipline and I haven't uh, been paying attention to Pastor Copeland in Sunday school because he told me in Proverbs chapter 6, go to the ant, oh sluggard. I ain't been paying attention. What, what, is, what are you doing in me, Lord? And show me the next right thing that I need to do. If you need wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you generously. Uh, but you need to ask in faith that, that you, you need to trust God that he's more committed to your wholeness than you are, that he wants your uh, fulfillment. He wants you to be complete even more than you want to be complete. And so he says in verses, basically in verses uh, six through eight, that you need to ask in faith, that trust will, that God will give you wisdom, that when you ask him, Pay attention to the next thing that happens. When you ask him, pay attention to the scripture that you read and he'll tell you, he'll show you. When you ask him, pay attention to your godly counselors because uh, some of them might have been telling you already what to do, but you ain't been listening. Ask in faith. What though uh, him say? Yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you one other to win. Endurance. Fight manfully on, onward. Dark passion subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. What else am I supposed to do? Just ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to lead you. He's willing to guide you. He's willing to aid you. And he will carry you through. Now, look at what else, because I want to get to this uh, last lick here. In verses basically uh, 9 through 11, after he talks about after he talks about this fact that joy is actually a calculation based on what you know and if you know and can understand from God's perspective that even all these various trials and tribulations he allows them to come into our life uh, listen to how I'm saying this sometimes the devil might try to send something for your destruction but God sometimes allows things in your life so you can be fully formed, so that you can grow up, so that you can have emotional resilience, so you can have spiritual maturity, so you can be fully who God created you to be. Perfect, that is mature. That word perfect means mature. So you can grow up in Christ. You can be mature, you can be complete, you can lacking nothing, like fully furnished, uh, fully equipped as a Christian, because now you've been through some stuff. And even if you don't, even if you're lacking, God can make up the difference because one of the major things that you might lack is insight, understanding, and God will give you that. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you insight. But in verses 9 through 11, he tells us, he shows us very clearly that uh, one, of the, one of the insights that you need to be aware of is that wealth, riches, possessions, all of that stuff is fleeting. And so don't get hung up on, on that, verse 9 through 11. The brother of humble circumstances is the glory in his high position. Rich man is the glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he'll pass away where the sun rises with a scorching wind, withers the grass, its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too, the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Part of wisdom, and this is very interesting, that sometimes we fall into tough times because of our relationship with possessions and with wealth. He says, look, wealth is fading. It's going to fade away. So don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in that. And then let's look at verse 12. I don't know if I'll get through the rest of this, but let's give it a, let's give it a go, shall we? Verse 12 says, now he's tying, 
verse 12 is tying all the way back to verse 2 and 3. Really? Uh, remember, verse 2 and 3, count it all joy when you encounter multicolored, various multidimensional trials and all those types of things, because now you know something. But verse 12 says, blessed is the man that endureth, that stands, that stays up under it. Blessed is the man or woman that endures temptation, or perseveres, pardon me, under trial. Uh, I think old King James says endures temptation. But uh, the modern translation says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because once he's been approved, or in other words, once he's passed the test, once he or she has been approved, he or she will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let me read the rest of this and then let's come back and unpack this and I think we'll be done for today. Let no one say when he was tempted, I'm being tempted of God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Okay, what's he saying here? He says, okay, let me go back to where I started. This is what James said. Blessed is the person who endures, who perseveres under the strain. Why? Because once you've been approved, that is, once you have passed the test, once your faith has gotten the, the what, what do we used to call this? The uh, good housekeeping stamp of approval. You remember that? Once your faith has been approved, you shall receive the crown of life. Now, this is a little tricky right here. So let me see if I can explain this and then we'll take a look at the anatomy of the autopsy of a sin. He says here that if you can stay up under it and your faith pass, passes the test, the reward, the end result is the crown of life. Now, some people would argue when he says the crown of life, he's saying that, you know, this is what we'll get when we get to heaven. In other words, that when uh, we have proven ourselves I'm trying to think of the old hymn. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Farther along, we'll understand, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. Uh, we'll understand it all by and by. That's what old hymn says. Some people take this text to mean that when we get to glory, we'll get the crown of life. I think in the context, however, a better translation is this, and I think the truth is this, that when we persevere under trial and temptation and our faith passes the test, the crown of life is not some kind of reef or something we get when we get to heaven. But the reward that we get, the end result that we get as part of passing the test is life. I don't think he's talking about the crown of life. The crown is life. And what I mean by that is that obedience to God is its own reward. Listen to what I'm saying, children. Obedience to God Staying in there, hanging tough is its own reward because it's within the process of enduring that you actually get your life, that you actually are experiencing life. Yeah, yeah, you, yes, there's rewards in heaven for you. But what I'm saying is that holiness is its own reward, that being in right relationship with God and learning how to stay up under the pressure, learning how to be obedient and to persevere and, and, uh, to, to, to the extent that your faith proves itself authentic is its own reward and the crown is life. The, the reward, the end result that you get is life abundantly, life to its fullest, life the way God intended right here and right now. 
That don't mean that you're going to have all the money that you want or that everything is going to be perfect, but it means that you have eternal life. Now, this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus said something to the extent uh, that uh, don't get caught up in riches and all that kind of thing or in the abundance of things that you possess, but uh, learn how to possess your soul because that's where real life is. And when you learn how to say no to temptations, when you learn how to hang in there under the pressure, the crown that you receive, not in glory, but the, the, the thing you get right now is you get real life. You get eternal life. You get God right here with you. He says that you're blessed. And, and that's why I, I, I tend toward this um, um, interpretation. He says, blessed is the man, not blessed will be, blessed is the man that endureth temptation and that perseveres under trial because it's that testing of your faith. It's that approval. It's that stamp on your faith that you actually, it's where you actually receive life. Do you know that um, uh, drug companies, even right now, will go through what they call clinical trials with this new medicine, this this new therapy. this Why do they do that? Because if they get approved, if it passes the trials, if they say this thing works, this thing is actually effective, they know that's, that means billions, trillions of dollars for them. So they'll take the, the whatever the thing is through various trials, through clinical trials, blind trials, this, that, and that, all that kind of stuff. Because they know that, hey, if we get this thing approved, that's money in the bank. Listen, Better than the FDA approval is faith approval. Can your faith pass the trial? And if it can, that's money. Come here, Job. They ain't listening to me. Job went through a whole bunch of stuff. But what did he say at the end? Very often, we focus on the fact that at the end of the book of Job, uh, Job gets double for his trouble. It, you know, uh, God returned, gives him wealth and riches and gives him a big family and all that kind of stuff. But read the book again. According to Job, he says this at the end of the book of, of Job. He says, I've heard of you by the hearing, but now I see you for myself. The reward of coming through that thing was a deeper relationship with God. Yeah, he got all the other stuff, but that stuff didn't even matter to Job. That never mattered to him. He wanted more of God. And he got that. He said, I, I thought I knew you, but now I really know you. That's my reward for coming through all this. And Job would say, I would go through all of that again just to get to know you like I know you now. See, there's some ways you can't get to know God unless you've been through some stuff. And that's the reward. See, now, here's why I'm focusing on that, and I got to get off it. I told you, obedience is, is its own reward. If you're just obeying God so you can get something from God, then in essence, the thing that you're trying to get from God is your God, and you're trying to use God been, uh, you're trying to use God so you can get to what you actually worship. And the reason I'm saying this is I've, I've been talking to a couple of my uh, protégés uh, earlier this week, and we're dealing with this issue of lust and this, that, and other. One of them is a young man that's single, another is a young man that's married. And the young man that's married was, in essence, sort of dealing with this fact, well, man, I, I did what I was supposed to do before I got married. I maintained my purity and this, that, and other. And now in my marriage, I'm having this struggle. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You wasn't supposed to be maintaining your purity so you can get something in your marriage. You maintain your purity because that's your life right now. You got your reward in the sense that while you were trying to do what God was calling you to do, he was keeping you. He was sustaining you and all that type of thing. But you were enjoying fellowship with him. You don't do stuff to try to make God sign on the dotted line. Because I did this, now you got to do that. That ain't how that works. I was dealing with the young man that was single and we dealing with purity issues this and that. I said, listen, obedience is its own reward. You're being obedient, not so when you get married, you can say, okay, because I did this, now God owed me that. No, no. You're being obedient because God is trying to keep you from some stuff. He's protecting you from destroying your own life. And holiness, y'all don't want to hear me today. Holiness is its own reward. Why? Because you get closer to God. You, you have actual life. Now, let's look at this. I got to uh, see if I can give me these last five or 
the six minutes. Let's see if we can't uh, get as far as we can right here in this thing. Verse 12, we already looked at, but look at verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. You need to know not just the calculus of joy. You need to, to know, you need to do an autopsy on your sin. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things here and then we'll be done. Look at how sin starts. And it's a very predictable process. Um, I already read the scripture. So let's unpack it. Sin does not, God doesn't tempt anybody to sin because he's not tempted by sin. He doesn't, sin, uh, the temptation to sin never comes from God. So you can't say, well, God, why you made me this way? God, why did you do this? God, why? no, that ain't, no, that ain't where it's coming from. It comes from sin always starts with a desire. And usually it's a legitimate desire that the enemy is trying to get us to fulfill in an illegitimate way. Jesus had fasted for 40 days. He said, I know you're hungry. Go and make these stones into bread. Well, hunger, that's a legitimate, that's a God-given thing. Yeah, you're supposed to be, God put hunger in us. Otherwise, we would just keep on going and never fuel. So he put a mechanism in there and said, oh, fool, you better eat something so you can have some energy. So oh, I'm hungry. Oh, yeah, let me put something in here. Ain't nothing wrong with hunger. That's a legitimate desire, thirst. Uh, companionship, whatever, legitimate desire. But the tempter always tries to get us to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way, either in illegitimate way or in the improper timing type of thing. So if you read the scripture here. Here's the anatomy of sin. It starts with desire. He says, verse 14, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own desire, his own lust. God didn't put that in you. Uh, he, he didn't put the desire to go against him in you. He might have put hunger. He might have put thirst. He might have put the appreciation of beauty. He might uh, have put the desire to have companionship. Yeah, all of that is God given. But the desire to shortcut, the desire to get it some kind of illegitimate way, that comes from the enemy. It starts with the desire, and what the enemy does is he deceives us. <laughs> That's why he says, verse 16, don't be deceived. The enemy will take a desire. He'll help us to believe a lie. We'll make a decision to disobey. And then the end result is death. Uh, watch how that works. In the first couple of pages of the Bible, Eve, fooling around with the snake, she saw that the tree that God had forbid them to eat from, saw that the Fruit on the tree was good for food. Now, remember, remember, ain't nothing wrong with being hungry. God said, just don't eat from this tree. And in point of fact, I've given you an all-you-can-eat buffet. You got every tree of the garden of which you can freely eat. <laughs> Literally, you got the whole world. Just leave this one alone because that one, that's not good for you. Leave that one alone. She had a legitimate desire for food, but the enemy said, well, did God say you can't even touch it? What's God knows this, and she got deceived. Then what she do? She made a decision. Not just her. It wasn't just Eve, because the Bible says clearly Adam was standing there with her. Made a decision to disobey. They ate of the fruit, and guess what happened? Death entered into the world. That's how you and I sin. Every sin you and I have ever committed. This is the autopsy of sin. We had some kind of desire that more than likely was actually a godly desire if you got all the way up under it. The desire for connection, the desire for approval, whatever, the desire for attention, any of that. But you went at it an illegitimate way or out of God's timing. Why? Because the devil tricked you into thinking that uh, well, ain't nobody going to know or it ain't going to hurt nobody. I ain't hurt nobody but me. Or, you know, everybody's doing it. Or, you know, you know the lies that you like to believe. And what happens? The Bible says, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's the anatomy. Now, how do I get out of this? Okay, there's a push and pull. I'm done when I say this. I have much more to say, but let's get this in. 
how do I handle my trials and temptations is it, it, a push and pull effect. One is you got to understand, okay, what's the end result? Let me say it this way. Play the movie all the way out. As you're facing this temptation, let's talk about temptations. You're facing this temptation. You have a legitimate desire. You want to fulfill that desire, which by the way, the reason we fast is to learn how to tell our desires, I hear you, I see you, now sit down. <laughs> the reason we fast is so that we can understand that just because I have a desire doesn't mean I have to act on it right now. Even if it's, a, if it's a legitimate desire, like hunger, I can say, yeah, I'm hungry, but I'm not going to eat right now because I'm a fully formed Christian. I'm not a dog. I'm not a child. I can say no to my desires and say, sit down. I ain't, I'm fooling with you, but be quiet. Shh. I got business to take care of. That's what you're telling your desires when you fast. Listen, we've got a push and pull effect here. I want you to play the movie out next time you have a temptation. Where will this end? I, I have a desire, but am I listening to a lie about this desire? And how does it play out? Uh, uh, play the movie all the way out so that you can see, well, man, if I did, I'll never forget. I'm trying to remember what this venue was. It was a venue with, uh, well, I'll tell you what it was. It was late night at a uh, National Baptist Convention. And I was standing with some preachers and a particular friend of mine uh, was being tempted uh, by this young lady. He said, Cope, I said, man, I, I don't know what to do. I said, okay, let's play the movie out. I said, okay, now you have a wife and you got children and you got a, a, a big church. Now, if you go and do what this um, young lady wants you to do, what's going to happen is you can't keep it a secret. It's going to come out some kind of way. I don't care how slick you think you are. It's going to come out. What's going to happen is it's going to impact your wife this way. It's going to impact your child this way. It's going to impact the church this way. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. And then you're going to, uh, you're going to lose your reputation and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, years from now, you're going to look back and say, man, if I had just said no, I, I sat with him and I played the movie all the way out. And since he was uh, this particular person, uh, he was like a financial guy. I said, so think about it. Uh, your wife going to get, she going to divorce you. Your wife going to get half. And then, you know, the church is bringing in this amount and you're doing this amount of money. So you're going to lose just conservatively in the first, you know, X amount of years, X amount of dollars. And it was a, a large, <laughs> a large sum. That joke went on back to the room. <laughs> you see, he left her alone. Went on back to the room. As did I, because I learned how to play the movie out. Okay, if I do this, what's the end results going to be? How is this going to play out? Play the movie out. But wait a minute. I got to leave you when I say this. Don't just play the movie out. Play the movie back. I, I, let me read this and then I'm done. Play the movie back. Verse 17. I'm not going to get to all the rest of it. But just look at verse 17 and I'll be done for today. Verse 17 says, every good thing and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. What, what does that mean? Think about the goodness of God, not just the goal, the end result, but the goal will help you because the end result is my wholeness, my completeness, my maturity in Christ, lacking nothing if I can stay up under this pressure. The end result, if I follow sin, if I follow this thing, let me play this movie out. Okay, I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. I'm a, God will not be pleased. I'm, uh, the, uh, uh, the anointing that he has on my life, you know, uh, even though he'll never leave me nor forsake me, but I won't be effective in ministry. I done, I done played that movie out. But wait a minute. I got to play the movie back too. Think about how good God is being. That's what the Bible says. What, Romans chapter... Uh, 2 verse 4 uh, is the kindness, the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's the goodness of God that will keep you from sinning. When you play the movie back, that is, how, how is that? Every good thing I have, God has given me. And he's the father of lights. There's no shadow of turning in him. Uh, think about how good God has been to you. 
The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, that the reason some people fall into depravity is they don't acknowledge God and they don't give him thanks. Thanksgiving to God is a prophylactic. Why? Because as you, here's what the old folks say, when I think, y'all ain't never heard this, of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. If you think, if you play the movie back, where you've been and how good God has been, then all of a sudden, that'll help you see this temptation of this trial in a different way. Let me give you a Bible on that. You remember when um, David had uh, committed that great sin against Bathsheba and Nathan, the prophet, uh, came uh, to challenge him about it. Well, well, what happened? Well, David had a desire. Enemy tricked him into thinking that wasn't nobody going to know about it and you know, he can get away with it, fool around, and um, I mean, literally, physical death in that situation because he uh, ultimately killed um, Uriah and all that type of thing. But there's a passage in there where God, through Nathan, is talking to David, and he basically says, um, I was trying to find the exact uh, point in here, but basically, he, yeah, here it is. I'm looking right at it. I'm sorry. First, Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. Uh, Nathan plays the movie back for David. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. I'm done when I read this. He says, I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added even more things to this. Now think about what God is saying. He said, man, I gave you, I wasn't even finished giving you all I wanted to give you. And then you're going to go after this man's wife? That's just like Adam and Eve. And that's just like you and I. But Adam and Eve, you got the whole world. I want you to eat, freely eat. Just leave this one alone because that's bad for you. what they do? Got the seed, chose that one. David, king. I already got everything you want. And God said, I want to give you more. But then you're going to go after this dude's wife? He ain't got but one wife. You got a few. And you're king. And I would have gave you more stuff. And you're going to go after this one thing. Same thing happens to you and I. When we don't play the movie back. Play the movie back. God has been good to you. And even the stuff that feels bad is good because it's working, it's working for your good to grow you up, to fill you out to make sure you're not a half-baked Christian. And he keeps on giving good gifts. He says, uh, the father of life, uh, every good gift comes down. That word there literally means it keeps coming down. He's, keep, he's constantly giving you good stuff, even today. So if you will play the movie back, your heart will be filled with gratitude, and then all that temptation and even those trials will have less of a pull on you. I have much more to say, and I've fooled around and I'm sorry, didn't get all of it in, but I want you to read James chapter one again, and then for next week, read James chapter two. That's where we will be in James chapter two, and let's see what God will do for us. And if you're going through right now, you don't know what to do, just ask. Ask the Savior to help you. Ask God to give you wisdom. Lord, show me the next right thing that I should do, and then expect him to answer through his word while you're sitting silently in prayer through godly counsel. Play the movie out, but play the movie back. Play the movie out before you make a decision that could affect your life for the rest of your life. And if that temptation is really pulling, play the movie back. That is, what has God done for me already? And if I wait, won't he give me more than even this little thing that I'm after? That's enough for you today, children. I love you and God loves you most. I need you to do me a favor. Um, join us in our fast. We're in a financial fast right now during Lent. Uh, don't buy anything that's non-essential. Try to use cash as much, much as you can. Um, uh, make your breakfast, your lunch, you know, and take that to work as opposed to eating out. No eating out unless you just have to. I'm out of town, so I got to eat something. But I'm asking you to join our financial fast 
And then every Friday here during Lent, we're doing an absolute food fast. Thursday night to six, starting at 6 p.m. to Friday at 6 p.m. And we're doing, doing a uh, social media fast. Friday at 8 p.m., get off social media. Don't get back on till you come on here for Sunday school at 8 next Sunday. Looking forward to seeing you. And I hope you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.